Hello you mob, welcome back to my channel, Loretha Brown here, hello! Today we're going to be talking about the legendary William Cooper. William Cooper was a proud Yorta Yorta man, Aboriginal activist and human rights advocate who has gone on to become, I would argue, one of the most important people in both Aboriginal and overarching Australian history. Yet, like countless other mob stories, his legacy has pretty much gone unnoticed and, and his stories for the most part pretty unknown and he hasn't really made his way into any of our Australian textbooks and so I thought today we would just share his story because it's so interesting. William Cooper for me holds a very special place in my heart. Number one because obviously of just like the extent of his legacy and how that you know, some of the policies that he would have helped pass and implement have gone into effect me today as an Aboriginal woman, but also because he's from Melbourne's Western Suburbs, repping that 3011, whoop whoop. And so, yeah, he's just this like local hero, like, icon arguably. So Uncle William Cooper's activism was most prominent in Australia in the 1930s. And in my last video, I talked a little bit about, uh, about what was going on at the time. So for example, the then Prime Minister Robert Menzies declares war, uh, Australia's like involvement in the Second World War. Because of this you see things like women entering the workforce and there's a recession at the time so it's a really poor you know era and there's just it, the 1930s become this significant period of economic social and political change so just that's kind of the area in which Uncle William Cooper was the most active. William Cooper is known primarily for four four things? <laughs> four. Four things. Number one, for the establishment of the Australian Aborigines League, which would go on today to be called the Australian Advancement League, which is based in Northcote. Number two, for creating what would become Nadelquick here in Australia. Number three, for organising the first ever official day of mourning ceremony, which would go on to become, as we know it today, Survival or Invasion Day. And lastly, and the point I find the most interesting and intriguing, is William Cooper was the first recorded person, not even Aboriginal person, just person, um, to actively stand up and protest against the Nazis' treatment of Jewish mob um, during the Second World War and during the Holocaust, um, which is just extraordinary. So yeah, let's get into his story. So William Cooper was born in 1860 um, as a proud Yorta Yorta man up in Yorta Yorta Territory here in Victoria. Um, and he was the fifth of eighth children, so he came from like a really big family. He was an Aries, by the way. And when he was really young, his mother and his brothers and some other members of his mob, you know, his relatives, were forcibly retained by the Malgola mission um, up near the Goulburn River, which kind of means that like the mission was like, you kind of have to come with us or else, which was very common, you know, amongst mob at the time. When I was writing the script for this, I realized that most people probably don't even know what a mission is. Um, I remember when I first moved from my little regional town, which had a mission to uh, Melbourne and to living in the city, people didn't know what they were. It was bizarre to me. It was really, it was really shocking even as well because I, it was such an integral part of my life and my mob's life for ye for years, you know, for decades. And to come to the city and people just not even knowing what they are was always so strange to me. Um, just quickly, missions were set up by missionaries who were kind of like really um, strict Christians who wanted to teach all us poor mob Christian ways and missionaries were really poor uh, places that didn't have very good conditions and everything was controlled by the white man, you know, it was controlled by these mission managers that would come in um, in line with the church and church values and you know, the whole doctrine was kind of to convert mob into being good Christians and to be holy and to be civilized and to kind of, you know, turn us good, um, turn us white and really, you know, really, really evil places. I, 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 you know, I don't like them at all. Catholics today will actually describe those missionaries who kind of went to, you know, Aboriginal reserves as these kind of heroes and these kind of martyrs because Look how generous they are for bringing religion and bringing prosperity to these poor brown people um, and their praise. So, you know, it's, it's a, there's, there's two sides to it, but no, I've never, I've never liked the idea of a mission. Um, but they still exist today. You know, Kempsey has a mission. Now, Buckerheads has a mission. Coffs Harbour has a mission. Barrowville has a mission. Most, pretty much every regional town, every little country town in Australia will have a history of a missionary or a reserve or still has one running today. Um, if you want like, I suppose a kind of crude 
comparison you could probably think about like maybe some of the shanty towns in South Africa it's a complicated issue but I think it's perfectly explained by Iatsis who say Aboriginal people suffered poor living conditions and poor health on many reserves and missions with substandard shelter or housing rations poor education employment was controlled often with rations for payment and wages withheld and speaking language and other cultural practices were prohibited yeah I could only imagine kind of what William Cooper was going through um, when that was happening. Just think about the musical The Book of Mormon, who was written by the same guys that created South Park, like my favorite TV show of all time. Um, the whole premise of that kind of award-winning musical was making fun of these white missionaries that went to, they go to Uganda and kind of try and convert brown people into the good Christian ways. Just quickly, just because I feel like I didn't explain that very well, here's a quick video of some of the elders at the Lake Tars mission, um, kind of explaining what the everyday life was like um, growing up yeah, in a mish in back in the day. So have a listen and just understand that these things are still going on today and they're still, you know, segregation is well and well and well and truly exists still here in Australia. Um, and missions kind of exemplify that. So William Cooper and his family arrive on the mission uh, at Malgola and the mission manager is this guy called Daniel Matthews. And William Cooper, he's just a little kid at the time, he kind of starts to get into literacy and reading and stuff. And this mission manager is like pretty taken back by how quickly, you know, uh, William Cooper is picking up English and writing skills. From there though, William Cooper's formal education as like a little kid is really sporadic. Um, at the time, there's actually no requirement for mob to attend school. There's no mandatory, like you got to go to school now. So when he was little, he kind of just moved around the mission freely. In fact, in an interview that William Cooper actually did when he was 76, he talks about how he only had about like seven months of formal formal schooling throughout his entire life, which is in, just an incredible fact because he went on to become like an icon um, and known for his like letter writing skills and his like writing abilities. So I just thought that was interesting. So instead of going to school, Wim Cooper starts working at, from a very young age in the household of Sir John O'Shaughnessy, um, a pastoralist. I, I don't know how to pronounce his word. Pastoralist? It just means like a sheep farmer, <laughs> a sheep farmer um, who was also a Victorian member for parliament and he would go on to become the second ever premier of Victoria. Yeah, so William Cooper is kind of growing up in this household, working in this household for this guy that is very much invested in Australian and particularly Victorian politics. So I feel like he'd probably be learning a few things at this age. So as William Cooper is working in this household, um, John O'Shaughnessy, this guy, he, he you know, he, he's got lots of money and he owns like lots of different houses and farming networks all throughout Australia. Uh, he's got like a farm in Queensland, Victoria, New South Wales, and William Cooper starts traveling around with him. And I know this is a bit of a push, but it kind of reminds me a little bit of like Che Guevara's motorcycles diaries story. Um, if people are unaware of that. So uh, Che Guevara, who's like the legendary uh, guerrilla kind of communist leader in Cuba. Uh, so Che Guevara originally started out as like a, a medical student, like he was training to become a doctor. And pretty much after he finished his medical school, him and his mate are like, hey, we're gonna go all around South America and do the whole thing and travel before we go back and become doctors. You know, cause it's like a job for life kind of thing. This is the big trip before we settle down. And yeah, so they kind of go on this big trip all through South America. You know, they started Argentina, they go through Chile, they go through Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil, the whole thing until they get to Cuba. And throughout this trip, Che Guevara is completely transformed and his kind of revolutionary politics is completely changed. Um, he started out wanting to be a doctor and by the end of it, he became a communist leader. And I would argue that, you know, that was mostly because of how he saw his fellow, you know, his fellow countrymen being treated through South America. You know, at the time, um, indigenous people weren't treated very well in South America. You know, I'm going to argue they still aren't. But he kind of saw that and he saw, you know, farmers and he's seen all the mob and he saw the way that people were treated and knew that the system didn't work for him. Because of this journey that kind of radicalized him, he knew that that's what he wanted to do. And so to go back to William Cooper, I would argue that in these kind of really early years of him kind of entering young adulthood, you know, he was still a teenager at this point, he was traveling all throughout Australia and he would have encountered other mob, he would have seen how, how badly we were treated back in the day, 1930s, all through Victoria, New South Wales, whatever. And I think that him seeing that would have kind of, I don't know, radicalized him in a sense. And I think that it would have, I don't know, it would have sparked something in him. So now William Cooper has reached adulthood and he's in his young 20s and like any young person that's like on the brink of freedom, what does he do? 
He starts studying the Bible. Okay, you know how we all do that. Yeah, so he starts reading up about the Bible and he starts taking this really strong interest in kind of its vocabulary and in, you know, its ideals. So I think this point is kind of summed up perfectly by the historian James Wolven. Um, in this BBC History Extra podcast, which I swear this isn't like <laughs> like an ad for them or anything. Um, please listen to this episode because it's so interesting and it's free. It's on Spotify. I'll put like a link here somewhere. But pretty much this historian James kind of argues that, um, you know, for an oppressed people, in his, in his own example, he's talking about, you know, um, slavery and slave revolts that happened in the Americas and in the South Americas um, and how religion kind of, radicalized you know oppressed peoples um and the point that he kind of makes which i i kind of have to agree with um and i swear i'll link this back to william cooper i'm getting there it seemed like a tangent it's not a tangent but the point that he makes is he says that for a while he used to view religion as this kind of like way to pacify people as a way to pacify aboriginal people on missions through you know missionaries and whatnot but rather his evidence is kind of proving now that religion um, and Christianity in particular kind of provided, it becomes this kind of like weapon, which kind of, if anything, did the opposite thing, you know, mob were picking up the Bible and it had images in it talking about, you know, salvation and heaven and, and stories like, you know, Abraham, you know, freeing the Jews and, and stuff that kind of, it, it was an alternative to the reality of what mission life was like and added with that, you know, you get charismatic you know, Aboriginal preachers and, 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 and um, who, who emerge now as leaders in communities and people look up to them and suddenly it's actually kind of, you know, <laughs> it's gone from pacifying mob to suddenly kind of being like, actually, you know, I want salvation and I want these things that are kind of described in the Bible um, and I can do that myself. And so to link it back to William Cooper, um, I think that a mixture of kind of seeing traveling around you know the australia as a young teenager and now also reading the bible and really starting to understand what equality meant true equality meant would have really kind of kick-started his avid interest in politics um yeah but that's just an idea i don't know i'm just theorizing <laughs> so in 1881 william cooper gets his own private i suppose tutor teacher type thing up in the mission and he starts reading up about people, uh, well, indigenous rights movement in, for example, like South America and New Zealand. And so he kind of starts to get an, an idea of like how to kind of, you know, spark change, which is important for in a few years to come. So now William Cooper is like an adult and he's, he works on a few different missions all around. He works at Margola, which is his original place. Uh, and Kamragunja mission. Now I know you all know what Kamragunja mission is because the sapphires. We've got a couple of sisters who tell me that they're from down the road a bit in a place called Kramaranj. 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 Good night, folks. Best film of all time. I'll say it. So he's at a few different missions now, and he has to take up a a bunch of different random jobs just to kind of, you know make money for his family so he's like a horse breaker at one point you know just a general farmer a, 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 a sheep shearer but his kind of like political goals and his political aspirations always remain and in his free time um he joins like a union and he joined yeah the australian workers union and yeah that kind of gives him his first kind of i suppose formal political you know uh space so during his time in the Australian Workers' Union, he champions, you know, uh, Aboriginal communities that were denied aid during, you know, the recession and the drought. So, yeah, he kind of, he's slowly making his way up the political ranks, I suppose. So when he joins a union and starts to become more outspoken, it kind of, it doesn't work in his favour. So he goes to the mission's board manager and kind of, you know, protests against the horrible treatment mum were having on the mission and, and, you know, housing standards, rations, the whole thing. And he gets... Uh, I suppose banished from the mission so he has to leave years later as well that same community at Kamragunja mission would go on to do the Kamragunja walk-off which is like this famous historical aboriginal event where you know all the mob kind of got up and just protested um treatment 
So the next little part is about William Cooper's move to the big city here in Melbourne. So while he's in his 70s, he, he finds out that he's like ineligible for the pension if he remains in the mission. So he moves to Melbourne and he moves to Footscray in here in the western suburbs. And he moves here in 1933. Here he finds his calling as like an activist and as an organizer and as like a relentless letter writer. He was really well known for like writing heaps of letters and getting up all in those politicians' mailboxes. Even though he like moves here pretty much to settle down later in life, retirement definitely isn't on the plate for William Cooper. And what he starts to do is he starts to hang out with all the mob in Fitzroy, which was like the, the kind of area where all, all the old activists back in the day kind of hung out and met and, and, and you know, did all these, you know, political um, meetings, I suppose. So yeah, he starts hanging out with some of the mob there. And then in 1936, William Cooper and some other fellas there uh, create the Australian Aborigines League, which would go on today to become the uh, Aboriginal Advancement League, which is based in Northgate. And just iconic. They just, they take off. So the league became defunct during World War II, which was declared in 1939, remember? But it is picked up again in 1945, um, by Cooper's protege, Uncle Sir Doug Nichols and Uncle Bill Onus. So Bill Onus, who was like another really incredible activist, who was worth looking into completely within himself, um, yeah, re revives it after the war. And fun fact, just because I thought it was interesting, his son, Lynn Onus, went on to become this really famous Australian uh, painter and artist. And he was the guy that actually made the Captain Curry comic books, if you guys remember those. Small world, thought it was really cool. And Doug Nichols, who was the other fella involved in the league, he went on to become one of the best AFL footballers of all time ever. I know I'm biased, but it's true. And he originally kind of, uh, I suppose, applied to play for uh, Carlton Football Club back in the day. But the coaches refused to rough him down because he was black and no one wanted to touch his skin and super racist. And so he went on to go play for Fitzroy and then became like one of the best players of all time. So ultimate underdog story. But yeah, he's just like an icon here in Melbourne. Um, but apart from like his obviously like incredible football career, he also went on to become, um, he got a knighthood for his activism, his football, and he also got the governorship of South Australia. So just like cool guys back in the day. So with Bill Onis, Sir Doug Nichols, and William Cooper, they become like this really cool dream team and they get shit done. So now that the league is established, one of the most important and most famous campaigns that they do is this petition uh, which they kind of send straight to King George V kind of demanding that there is, you know, Aboriginal representation in Parliament. You know, an Aboriginal person representing Aboriginal people. Who would have thought, you know? Um, they also go on to create the Aboriginal Day of Mourning on January 27th, which today would go on to become, you know, Invasion and Survival Day. So in 1938, this Aboriginal Day of Mourning kind of was the first time um, publicly the question kind of was posed to Australian public, you know, what, what does this day, what does celebrating Australia Day mean for Indigenous people? It's just so cool to think that he started it and he was from Footscray and, you know, this is a protest that I would argue most of us kind of go to today. The Aboriginal Day of Mourning would go on to become as well um, the kind of frameworks for NAIDOC, NAIDOC Week. It originally became uh, the National Aborigines Day and then Aboriginal Sunday, which sounds kind of fun. <laughs> I wish we still had Aboriginal Sunday. And then years later, it's all kind of evolved into yeah, what we would become Invasion Day and NAIDOC Week. So now I suppose the bit that everyone's kind of been waiting for is William Cooper's, you know, protest against the Nazis. So on November 9th in 1938, Jewish businesses, synagogues, houses and schools were destroyed. Dozens of people were killed and over 30,000 men were arrested and taken to concentration camps in what is known as Crystal Knot, the Night of Broken Glass. And so that news made its way back to Australia and William Cooper was sitting at home one night here in Footscray when he heard about, you know, the Nazi treatment of Jewish mob and he knew that he had to do something about it. So Uncle William, um, along with the same followers from the Aboriginal Advancement League, which at this time had grown super big, led an active protest, like a march from Footscray where they marched, um, you know, from Footscray Station to Queen Street, which is almost 12 kilometres from here into Melbourne, from, from Footscray to like the Melbourne CBD. Um, yeah, protesting against against this night and against against you know Jewish mistreatment. So keep in mind that this uh, protest led by William happened almost a month after the initial Crystal Knot uh, tragedy. Um, I suppose that would have 
been, I suppose you could explain that back to just how long news would have taken to travel. Um, but yeah, so they, they marched on this, this, this late uh, November evening. It was a warm summer's night and, and they arrived at the German consulate, which is where they were all walking to. When they arrived at the consulate, no one would let them inside, but Uncle William passed a letter over to some of the guards um, at, at the embassy, I suppose. And yeah, so a letter was passed, but it's still kind of unknown where those letters are going today. The German guards at the consulate refused to accept the letter, but just the action of doing it kind of made, you know, Uncle William Cooper a bit of a hero in the eyes of the Jewish community. It is considered by many as the only protest of its kind, um, according to the Australian National Museum, which is just like, it's so cool to think about. Like, to imagine that Uncle William Cooper couldn't vote, you know, the stolen generation policy was well in effect. He, the blatant racism that he would have experienced every single day and, and, and understanding the kind of detriments of, of having his land taken away and just everything colonization does wrong. Um, but to think that he still kind of stood up for a community that he probably didn't know a lot about is just extraordinary to me. And in my eyes, it makes me very proud to be mob, makes me proud to be, you know, from the Western suburbs. And oh, he is so cool. And I think that that protest all the way back in 1938, you know, really cemented this kind of deep, long-standing kind of relationship with Jewish mob here in Australia and with us mob and we're friends now. <laughs> So William Cooper's legacy today is pretty extraordinary. So number one, in Shepparton, uh, there's like a big statue of him, which was released in some of the gardens there. Um, but also, which I think is so interesting, is the fact that there is um, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, in Israel, there is like a little tiny William Cooper memorial, like a garden, like that's, that's so cool and interesting. So in 2017, Uncle Bodhi, who was William Cooper's grandson, actually flew to Israel to visit that kind of uh, memorial that I was talking about. Um, and honestly, the photos from the trip are so wholesome and it's so lovely to watch, like to look at. So I'm gonna. An emotional visit to Israel today for an Australian Aboriginal family to honor their grandfather, Aboriginal activist William Cooper, who stood up against the Nazi regime protesting the persecution of Jews in Germany. Retracing his footsteps, Aboriginal elder, 89-year-old Alfred Turner, is a long way from home. Once again in Israel, this time with his son, to visit this plaque where his grandfather's name, William Cooper, has been enshrined. Oh, it means a lot to be here with Dad and everyone that's come here, um, especially to see William Cooper's name on the wall. I've heard so much about it over the years, I just haven't had a chance to get it before I come here to Israel. Wow. The Turner's history with Israel is a long one. Uh, he grew up in, an, in a time that uh, a lot of racism and uh, his people were dying. But also, I've got another little surprise for you all. You ready? Oh, hi everyone, Aretha from the future. We are currently at the William Cooper Footbridge in Footscray and I just thought it was incredible and I had to show this. So thousands of us have probably walked across this bridge at some point in our lives and I think it's just important that we recognize that this bridge was actually named after William Cooper uh, because this is the suburb that he loves and that he grew up in. So let's go take a closer look. And so here we are at the William Cooper Memorial, which stands on the Footscray Footbridge. And I think I've walked past this like every single day of my life. And I never really stopped to think about it until I made like made this video and started to understand his story. But it's so cool, it's like such a martyr, such a deadly person. And so God bless my man, my man. Uh, just quickly, I just want to thank Abe Schwartz, who is probably the most dedicated historian and activist who has been following and, and investigating and igniting passion people's passion for this story for decades. He's so invested in making sure that William Cooper's legacy is still around. That's where I got pretty much all my information from. He's really deadly. Um, so thank you so much for everything you've done for keeping this story alive. Um, if you want to donate to the William Cooper legacy, which is like a, uh, yeah, it's all about sharing this story, making sure that William Cooper is, is always remembered. Um, then you can do that down below. I'll do like links and stuff. Um, and yeah, I suppose, just to, just to summarize, I, I, I honestly think that William Cooper deserves to be a household name. Like he, he deserves a bloody like Hollywood movie with like all, with, you know, how crazy his story is. But um, 
he, he's just extraordinary. Like I said, he couldn't vote. He he would have just... Man, to be mob... To be mob in 2020 is hard, you know? But to be mob back in the 1930s, Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, he, he to, to think that he, he stood up for other mob and has gone on to do so much. So much. But he, he's, he doesn't, you know... No, no one really knows who he is. And he doesn't make his way into our history textbooks. And he doesn't kind of get get the recognition which he really does deserve so yeah yeah go and tell everyone you know about this just be like hey you guys know that about that guy in Footscray that there's other cool stuff here's a cool fact you might be able to impress someone with a cool history fact anyway thanks for watching also subscribe if you want up to you okay thank you for watching guys bye <laughs>